Og til formanden for Danske Landskabs Arkitekter, Karsten, eller Karen Sejer. Tak for det. Øh, jamen jeg vil også gerne sige velkommen, øh, og jeg vil sige tak til Arkitektskolen øh, Aarhus, øh, for at lægge hus til det her arrangement og bidrage til det. Øh, jeg håber, at det kan blive det første af flere øh, samarbejder øh, mellem Dansk Landskabsarkitektforening og Arkitektskolen i Aarhus. Øh, ja, jeg hedder som sagt Karen, så er jeg formand for Dansk Landskabsarkitektforening og vil også gerne benytte øh, lejligheden til at sige lidt om foreningen og hvem vi er, for øh, det er ikke så tit, vi er i Aarhus. Vi øh, kommer forhåbentlig til at være her lidt mere i fremtiden. Øh, vi er en forening med godt og vel 700 medlemmer. Vi arbejder politisk, øh, praktisk og strategisk med at udbrede kendskabet til og bevågenheden omkring landskabsarkitekturens betydning. Vi arbejder for at give vores medlemmer gode faglige arrangementer at samles om, som her i dag, hvor vi her i første omgang har Jenny Oselsen fra Snøhetta på besøg til at holde foredrag, og så har vi efterfølgende generalforsamling i foreningen, og lidt senere så er der middag. I år der har vi i DL, som vi også kalder os, haft, at man kan nærmest sige, et politisk gennembrud. Vi har nemlig fået hul igennem til Kulturministeriet, og det har vi gennem, at vi har sikret landskabsarkitekturen en plads i den arkitekturpolitik, den nationale arkitekturpolitik, som blev præsenteret for nylig. Her har landskabsarkitekturen for første gang blevet inddraget som en værdiskabende disciplin på lige fod med andre former for arkitektur. Øh, overskriften på arkitekturpolitikken er mennesker i centrum og vores medlemmer arbejder løbende med at udvikle by- og landskabsrum der sætter mennesker i centrum og uanset om vi arbejder i et urbant byrum en lommepark eller en stor offentlig park øh, så har det færdige projekt oftest en offentlig funktion der kommer os alle sammen til gode en stor del af landskabsarkitekters arbejde fokuserer altså på og skabe offentligt tilgængelige og inkluderende by- og landskabsrum. Integration og samspil, det er også noget af det, der er kernen i Norske Snøhetas tilgang til arkitektur og landskab. Snøhetta er en af verdens førende arkitekttegnestuer, der på meget overbevisende vis øh, formår at integrere arkitekturen i det omkringliggende landskab. Og for jer, der sidder her, behøver tegnestuen ikke hvis det ikke så meget mere introduktion. Det er tegnestuen, der står bag operan i Oslo, hvor bygningens tag fungerer som en offentlig plads. De har tegnet den norske ambassade i Berlin, og de står for en renovering af Times Square i New York, hvor de også har kontor. Jeg er derfor rigtig glad for at kunne præsentere Jenny Oselsen fra Snøhetta. Jenny er partner, og det har hun, været, eller hun har været ansat i hvert fald i Snøhetta siden 1995 været tegnestue ansvarlig på Snøhetter-kontoret i New York, og så er hun uddannet landskabsarkitekt fra Norges Natur- og Biovidenskabelige Universitet og fra Cal Poly Pomona Universitetet i Los Angeles. Så med de ord vil jeg sige velkommen hertil, og velkommen til Jenny Oselsson. Tak, Karen. Thank you. We had a little discussion because usually when we are in the Scandinavian countries, I always say, no, then I do it in Norwegian. But then there was someone, no, there maybe are more people that are non-Danish speaking or don't speak that Danish that well. And then it can be a little bit too hard to follow my Norwegian. So we decided I'll do it all in English. So, okay. The, and thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be, uh, uh, be here today. And I think the combination of the School of Architecture and the Dan Danish Landscape Arch Architect Association is the perfect combination because that's the way that Snøhetta has been working from day one. Landscape meets the build structure. So this, okay, I'll do the little pointer here. Let's see, yes. This is Snøhetta, the mountain. It's actually an existing mountain. And the really, really stupid story why we have got this name is a little bit strange. Because the first office we had downtown Oslo was on a loft, on a building uh, that was at the bottom floor. There's a very, very brown bar called Dovrehallen. 
And Dovre is a landscape plain up in Norway, and on top of that plain sits Snøhøta, the mountain. And this, the, the mountain has been a very mythological uh, mountain in the Norwegian history. And I just need to take this little thing because it's 2014. Because in, two, in 1814, 200 years ago, then we got our independence from the Danes. <laughs> so we have a big celebration this year. And the whole thing was that Dane, no, Norway, had, Norway had been underneath Denmark for 434 years. And uh, during the Napoleon Wars, the Danes chose, you could say, the wrong side. So they lost the war together with the, uh, with the French, and then they had to give away Norway to Sweden. <laughs> so that's how it ended. So, we, so then we got underneath Sweden till 1905, because, before we got our independence. But there was a gap on a couple of months. And the Norwegians said, now we want our independence. We've been under the Danes for so long time. And they made their own constitution, that is like 17th of May, which is our big uh, national day. And the first paragraph in that says something, and it also says that it has to be true and unite till Dovre falls, actually. So this is a really important mountain in Norway. And also this brown bar that we named after, it's also Henrik Ibsen one of our really famous authors that uh, done a lot of the famous plays. He wrote about Pierre Gint, and he was inside Dovre, and the Dovre Hall, again the bound bar, and he said that that's where the trolls live. So here you go, it's not a, only a fjell ebe, it's also a <laughs> troll standing in front of you. Okay, that was a lot about this. <laughs> So that works. What we're going to talk about today is a lot of the project we have been doing is going to be almost chronologically, so it will be tons of picture. I'm going to speak pretty fast. It will take you almost an hour. Okay, so the people that have been traveling all the way from Copenhagen at the same bus as me for three and a half hour, you may fall asleep. It's okay. When you wake up, you will still hear me talking. So this picture is, in a way, I see Snöhöta. We're always working team, so we kind of a herd. And it's almost like this, that somebody's in the front, and somebody maybe are interested, and somebody now nah, turn another way. It's really about teamwork, how you are in a group, and how you have the group dynamics. OK, just to show you, this is actually where Snöhöta, the mountain is. And this is then Oslo. And then we have our two offices, one in Oslo, at Vippetangen and one downtown Manhattan, 25 Broadway. You see, thanks heaven for Google Earth, it's the same scale. You see the same landscape shape. We're looking now all over the globe to find new shapes so we can have new offices. <laughs> oh, kidding. This is about, we are 90 people in the Oslo office, it's, uh, and we are 40 people in New York, of, New York office. It's really started with landscape architects and architects at the, at the beginning, from day one, actually there were more landscape architects than architects from the beginning. 95, we got interior architects. Three years ago, we got graphic design department. Uh, I think there are 19 different nationalities in the Oslo office and 12 in New York. So we, we are still Norwegian, but we, we think we are very international. So this is our place in Oslo. It's everything open. It's the way we like to work, to share, because the team is always sharing. So we have a meeting here every second week uh, on the Monday, 1,600 square meters on one floor. And it's like when students work, we're all together. This is also the way to, then if you have something on your desk, somebody pops over and asks about what you're doing. And it's really the way also we do uh, our projects. The only place you actually can be alone is one place in the office, and that's at the handicap toilet. The rest of the toilets is unisex. So we have our common meetings, and it's all about the heads. We're not named after anybody. We're named after a landscape. And it's really about how people are sharing their thoughts and their ideas all together. So it's really to being the singular in the plural that we think it's important. And Rob, a colleague, he made this map. This is like one day in the office. And then you have the red and the yellow and the blue team. And then how this is how you walk around the whole day. The only thing, of course, that lacks here, where is the coffee machine? Because then it will be totally crammed over there. 
Every year we try to hike Snøeta. It's 2,286 meter tall. It's a 1,300 steep slope going up, and it's almost only rocks. And it's really our sort of mythological mountain, so we really like to climb that. Two years ago we were 53. Uh, last year I think we were 45 or something like that. My first trip on top was the weather was terrible. It started raining right away when, when we started to, to do the hike. And it's got more snow and it was mist and you could hardly see the next stick that you have to follow because you can't go outside the path. It's not like a path, you really just follow sticks. And when we got uh, almost to the top, one of my colleagues from Texas, he, he was sure he was going to die. So he said, don't leave me! I said, no, 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 we're not leaving anybody. Everybody to, should come up together. And of course we did it, but we couldn't see that we were on the top. So we just had to go down again. <laughs> the next time, the weather was fantastic. It was the most easy hike, even if it's really steep. And we could see musk ox on the way down, and it was really fantastic. I think that really describes how it is to work in architecture. Sometimes it's so easy, the clients are really nice, they're paying, and we win competition. The next day, everything feels like it's falling apart. But that's also the way we really like to work with the passion of the profession we're doing. Okay, yeah, here are the sticks. And yes, so it all really started with the library in Alexandria. In 1989, the office was really, it was really just kids out of school, starting late in 87. They decided to do, go into anonymous competition. It was 524 entries. And they were actually doing the competition in LA because somebody knew somebody that was there and they all got together. And in six weeks, they did the drawings. And of course, after half a year, whatever it was, they got a phone call, a very, very bad line from Egypt saying, you won the third prize. And it was, was it the first or the third? It was really hard to, to know. Of course, it, we got the right message. And when people got down there with their 80s, you know, outfits and hair, and they were so young, nobody thought that they would never ever make this contribution to build a library in Alexandria. It took actually four years before we got the commission. We even got help from our, at that time, Prime Minister, Gro Harlem Brundtland, to help us out to actually get the contract. So it was a really important start for the, for the office. Okay, this is uh, Alexandria, the bay. You see it's almost like a, you could say a circular shape. This is the site where I think the library actually was. And the circle was a shape that we really want to work with. So, at, and then of course Osiris, the goddess of, of uh, the sun, is circular. And at that time, the microchip, really the future, was also circular shape. So there was a lot of good intention in the circle. Uh, I don't know if it still is the seventh largest library in the world, but it's really a big library, and it sits right on the Corniche, where you walk along uh, the ocean and it's next to the university. The concept is really, really easy. You know when you are by the ocean, you always can see the horizon. And as you know, it's always the eye height. Doesn't matter how tall you are. So you can imagine, you have the horizon, you look at the ocean, and you have this circular disk, and you pull it down. So it's getting sloped into the water. So it said that actually where that uh, crosses the horizon, it's present. And then we say that everything that's below grade or the ocean is past and is stretching out into the future. And we know that the history of the library is very, very old, many thousand years old, so the future is even more. So this was the concept, past, present and future. So it is really a disk sloping down into the water, wind a pond around it. And we, this is actually the model from 89, from the competition. Uh, we worked with two really important elements to actually intersect with the landscape. It's the roof that's sloping down into the water, uh, and it, it's a very high-tech roof because of the sun direction into the library. And we had then uh, the outer wall, which is very low-tech, that is protecting the whole thing. Inside is like one big reading room, because the reading in the library, we thought that was the most important. It's actually seven floors inside the room, so it has all these different floors, but it feels very intimate as one big room. 
So then the, the wall, we, had, we worked together with an artist and, and a historian that we usually do very, very often work with artists all the way through the project. And they worked with interpretation of all signs and letters in all alphabets in the world, stitching them together. And we thought that it would be a really, really good idea to use granite. We thought that, okay, they know how to use stone in Egypt. They had done that for thousands and thousands of years, and just carving stone. What we figured out, they've forgotten that the last 2,000 years. So they don't do that anymore. And since we have a lot of good granite in Norway, we took them to Norway to actually teach them how to carve in stone again. And actually that was pretty interesting because although at the construction side, all the different firms had to team up with a national uh, firm, which means that because this was a very international project, much bigger than they had been building around, so they needed to team up to teach people. And just to have a hard hat on the construction site, nobody had seen that in, in Egypt before. So, of course, that was sold the first day the workers got it, but actually that was really crucial to keep it at very high standard at the construction site. So, the wall consists of one by one and one by two meter uh, pieces of granite that are carved. And then in front of that, it's a, it's a pond. And also for the landscape project, we were striving a lot to make them uh, not fence it because they said it had to be fenced. And we said, no, this is a pub public plaza. When the library is closed, you can't get in, but you should always get to the, uh, to the library's plaza. This should be 24 seven open. And we also decided that we wanted to use agriculture plants. They thought that was really strange. Why do we want papyrus and, and date palms and olive trees that's all over in the, in the countryside at agriculture land? But we said that's actually what grows best and you should be proud of that. So that was a very big change because they wanted something totally more exotic. Uh, it's a bridge going straight from the um, library to the university. So it's really handy for the, for the students. And actually, you see here the, the skyline, and then you have, I would say the library, maybe it's more a landscaper than a skyscraper. Uh, two years ago, with the uh, Arabic Spring, uh, there was a, a lot of trouble in Egypt, and we got almost daily feedback from, uh, from Alexandria, and we got these photos that actually students were standing hand in hand to actually protect the library. And then you really feel that you're making a difference when you make a, a project and a site uh, that they actually care so much about. So that's important for the whole city, this new project. Okay, um, this is just one little story inside the, the story because it's about the Nordic Embassy building in, in Berlin. Um, we were part of the competition for the common project uh, we did not win that. <laughs> we say that we will win one of ten competitions that we enter in, which means that we practice a lot. We lose so many projects. But that's also the way that we can sometimes get a really big project that helps us, that we can actually can survive. So there are ups and downs. Then we were one of five to compete just for the, uh, for the Norwegian uh, building. You see here with the red arrow. Uh, and we said that, okay, we want to do something special because it was uh, really important on the, on the public plaza, which maybe is not so public because you have to enter inside first. But uh, our clients said, no, 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 it's, you know, we don't have a budget for almost anything and it's just an office building, so it's nothing special. We said, no, we really, really want to do something with the facade that shows it's from Norway. So we were looking, we had been pretty good then in carving stone, so we went back to the quarry and said, uh, okay, maybe we can just try to get one piece and just send it over to Berlin. So this is one piece of Norway that will be in Berlin. So we actually took off the surface soil and the, the little vegetation on top and worked with an artist, Christian Brysta, that also helps us with the library to find this one piece that actually you do with a wire cutting. And the way to explain it, it, it is with a Danish cheese shaver, like the one you have, you know, you can just shave it and then you have a piece of cheese or you have a piece of stone. So this is 15 meter tall and five meter wide and 70 centimeter thick in one piece. 
to then get that out and then yeah we're going to transport it on um, the rivers into Berlin figure out and somehow that was absolutely too hard so we had to do it on a trailer we had to actually strengthen two bridges in Germany to get it all the way to Berlin but then the front was ready and we had our stone that could actually get right on spot yes 20 millimeters perfect is right there and it gets this fantastic, beautiful surface. It's treated by the glaciers the last 15,000 years. And then, of course, has this natural carving, which is really, really beautiful. And when you're inside the building foyer, it's tiny foyer, but you have the stone right, faced in, uh, right into your face. So the ambassador, his or she, is up here, don't have a view, but can look into a piece of Norway, and can tell a story when have uh, visitors and yes, uh, this is a real icebreaker. We have been really lucky to be working with a lot of cultural projects and this project is about Peter Doss. Uh, he was a bishop that lived from 1647 to uh, 1707. Yeah, it's in the Danish times, you know. <laughs> so he of course was educated in Copenhagen and he went up far north in Norway here to Olstahö. It's a fantastic, beautiful landscape. This mountain chain is called the Seven Sisters. And at the last sister, tip of her skirt is actually where the site is. So the bishop, he used to live here. And he was also writing a lot of poems about everyday life. And he was like a magnet uh, in the Nordic countries. So he actually had a lot of discussions with other bishops and important people at that time. So for his then uh, 300th anniversary, they, were, they wanted to make a cultural building, like a dialogue center. And you see it's really far up north. This is the polar circle. And uh, this is Peter Das himself. And this was the site. The original site was uh, at the agriculture land. Uh, the client had been working for 20 years to actually make the regulations so the, the farmer could let off his land. And we tried two sketch designs to make a good um, project, and we didn't really we didn't think it was a good project. And we, the problem was that the landscape is so majestic, it's so important, and the agriculture cultural landscape is the second most important. And then you have the church, which actually the uh, the oldest part is from 1250 and then the historical farmland building. So we said all of these are more important than the new dialogue center. We really have to make the landscape be the first and the second before the religion, and then actually our center could come. So we started to look at, could we get out of the site and do something totally different? And we then could see in the landscape, which has a very distinct shape, that we actually found that there was a dip in the landscape behind the church. And we knew, now knew how to cut in, uh, cut in stone. So we said, okay, we got the existing landscape. We can cut, get that out, get the new um, center in and redefine the landscape to make it very dramatic because this was, he was a Baroque po uh, poet, so he was very dramatic. So we thought we could actually be really dramatic too. And we said that the front of the building should not be bigger than the tiny farmhouses. So you really have to turn 90 degrees before you actually could see the front of the building. So here's a section, the existing landscape and the redefinition of it. And then, oh my God, when I was there to actually set out the, the sticks to actually do the cut in the landscape, and I said, like, are you 100% sure that it will be the perfect? And I was like, no, it has to be 50 centimeters in this direction. I hope it's correct. Yeah. <laughs> when they did the cut, it was so beautiful. The team leader, Maria, architect, she said, we're not going to build anything. It's so beautiful as it is. I said, I think maybe the client wants his center. So I think we have to just keep on the construction site. So it was growing up and filled in the space. On one side, you actually can go by. On the other side, there's a stair. And it's really close to the dramatic of the, the landscape. And you actually see the, the tiny, very beautiful church standing there. When we're doing the cut, it's gneiss, so it's almost becoming marble. 
it got these beautiful slits in the stone that actually then, of course, were filled with water and then with moss that was never been able to plan anything like that. So nature helped us a lot. And then, of course, the, the mirroring of the building into the wet wall when it's raining. So what is reality and what is uh, actually the existing and what is uh, something that is mirrored. And then you see the beautiful landscape on the other side. And during the northern, uh, northern light, it's really dramatic. And of course, at the end, you can walk on the top uh, to go the stair. Is it to heaven or is it to hell? You have to go up there to figure out how that is. And when you see it from as a bird, uh, it really is also piercing through the landscape. Okay, I have to talk a little bit about uh, the Oslo Opera and ballet. Um, in Norway, uh, opera and ballet has not high, it's not that many people that have cared about it. We have the theater from 1958, was not really a, an opera stage, it was an old theater. So it had been quarreling for about 50 years if, the, if it needed an opera house. And then there was where the site should be. There was a big discussion, at least for 20 years, I think five cultural ministers that couldn't decide where it should be. In the end, they decided, because this is a central station, downtown Oslo, and here is how it looked with all the roads. And they said that, okay, it's going to be exactly, this is Akersjelva, which is like saying, this is east side, this is west side of Oslo. It should actually be right on that point. So they, the really good thing about that was that to say that the cultural building, the cultural project should be the first project to set a standard for the transformation for the whole area. Like so many places around the world, you can't get to the ocean because it's cut off of a big heavy traffic road. So that was a very good start. So that was also an anonymous competition. It was in 2000. We hadn't finished the library. That was finished in 2001. We didn't have anything to do. We had to lay off people. And we said we really want to do this competition. Um, and I think there was 325 entries. And we were really, really, we didn't think we, were, we could win. So it was really also a fantastic opportunity that we actually, that they chose us for the project. You see here the site, which was actually how it was reg regulated, like a stamp. So they didn't ask for any kind of program for a public plaza at all. It was just the building. The streetscape should come after. So that was really harsh and not a good plan at all. So we decided we had to show them that we needed something different. So we started to look at the city grid in Oslo and the green hill Ekeberg Åsen, which is really important, downtown Oslo. Of course, Oslo is a small city and it's very green. But then we said that the new opera actually should try to reconnect these two lines. So it's just the stage tower that is tall. The rest should be as flat as possible, sloping down into the ocean. Again, you can talk about the horizon. When you are walking on a sloping plane, it's really how the horizon changes all the time. And since I didn't ask about any public plaza, I said, OK, if you don't want to go into the opera, because so many Norwegians say they don't want to, you should be able to walk on top of the opera. So we made the fifth facade as the public plaza and gave the city back, gave that back to the city. So it's really the curved wall that is the crucial point when it's going into the ocean. And then we have the carpet that's on top of it. And the, oops, sorry, a little fast. Uh, the factory, which is actually where all the people working in the back. And it's covered with a carpet that is the new plaza sloping down into the ocean, getting one element. And this is actually the renderings from the competition, not really uh, high quality renderings, you would say today. Um, but it's showing what we really wanted to do. And you have the ocean is really the most important and the connection to the green hill and the cityscape. And here is how it sits. And of course, when you have a white sheet of paper, you can cheat so much because everything sort of looks nice. This is how it actually looked. It was extremely trafficked right by, and it was a heavy, construction site because we were also digging into the ocean. 
Uh, here also we work together with three artists for the for the roof. So Jorun Sannes worked together, Kari Stensrud, landscape architect. So it's landscape architect, architect together with three uh, artists that worked actually on the carpet. And from the competition, we said that we really wanted a white building. We really wanted it to stand out, to be something totally different and something pure and special. And we talked about marble from, uh, from the beginning, but of course we were very unsure if it was possible. It's of course both for the cost, but also durability. So we're testing, I think for three years, together with the scientific people in Sintef in Trondheim, to make sure that it could stand the salt, the dust, uh, the, the zero, the freezing point, really hard, and, and also, of course, all the people that was going to walk on top of it. And actually, from all the tests, in the end, we figure out that actually the Carrara marble, the, like the um, Oprah marble from Italy, was actually the most durable. So that was fantastic that we had that opportunity. The whole uh, sloping area is cladded in marble. It's 19,000 square meters. It's like an extremely big puzzle, so 33,000 individual pieces. And this all together then make this puzzle of, of the roof. Uh, all the slopes that of course had to work with all the program that was indoor, but also that it was walkable. There was a long discussion about how do we do this with disabled people with a wheelchair? How can we get up there? It should be extremely easy to get to the front door. The slope is very, very gentle, no problem. But to get on top of the roof, that was hard. And then, of course, the start discussion. When you have a kink, when you have a step, you need to mark it with a contrast color. Like you have yellow, um, uh, tape on all these pieces that are kinks. We, we actually tested it out. It looks awful. It really ruined the whole thing. But then we come up with a good idea and we thought we can test it. We said that all the pieces that are actually lifted up that you actually can trip over if you don't look when you're walking, that is defined as art. The rest is actually landscape architecture or roof or public plaza. And that actually worked. So all these kinks are art, pieces of art. You can see it. <laughs> and the rest is the plaza. So like one piece, this piece is art, and this is not art. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so all of this stone is 10 centimeters deep. So then some of the kinks are 20 or 25. So it's really big pieces of, of marble. And a lot of different surfaces were tested out to find the right one. And then, of course, the indoor-outdoor situation was really important for us. How to try to almost fool people inside the opera and ballet, to try to see how it looks inside. So then the people, of course, started to walk on top of it. And they really wanted to see what was indoor. And people started to use it. And as you know, Norwegian, we love to go på tur. We love to go hiking. And that's what people are doing. They're actually, <laughs> they're, it's 24-7. They're up there walking all the time. You can get all the way to the ocean. Actually, the last part going into the ocean and the facade, on the, the vertical facade, is actually Norwegian granite. That's another story I can talk about that sometimes else, uh, later. But... Uh, if you go there, you will very easily see that the marble is totally crystal white, but the granite is pretty gray, even if it's white. So you will see that in the uh, material. The swans coming from the opera, it's been dancing, going out again. And then there's a lot of outdoor um, uh, concerts, and um, uh, many of them are free. And the one which was not a picture from, uh, from this time, it was totally hysterical. 10,000 teenager girls when Justin Bieber was here having his concert. And of course, the condition with the snow. And just a couple of words about the in, <laughs> the, what is going on inside. This is also a rendering from the competition. The penguins going to the opera. And then how we were talking about the, the curved wall, which is almost like a big instrument, yes, and then of course some of the art pieces that is inside these were our black boxes where the toilets and we made uh, managed to convince that that should be part of the art program and luckily Olaf Eliasson, he made a fantastic pieces of art to cover the toilets so it's really amazing <laughs> 
So this is the wooden structure, it's oak, and this is inside. It's a very traditional, uh, the, uh, 1300 uh, seats in the main theater. It's a traditional opera. And here is a lot of the interior is in wood. So the contrast from the outdoor with the white uh, uh, marble to the very warm and welcoming, uh, like being inside an instrument where you go to the, to the opera. Okay, I move over to Manhattan. In 2004, there was a, uh, or let's go back. In 2001, the terrible uh, uh, crime that happened, 9-11 uh, uh, at the World Trade Center. And then, of course, after that, it was a, a big issue to build up the site to know what to use it for. Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, they made a master plan for the area. And uh, Donald Liebskind, he won that competition, which had all the seven new towers. And inside is the Memorial Park that was won by Peter Walker and Michael Arad together. And then inside there again, this was the um, cultural complex, and this was the, no, sorry, this was the theater complex, this was the cultural complex. And uh, we had a chance to deliver in an RFQ, a pre-qualification, to maybe be part of one of these projects. We thought maybe that the, the theater project with the opera could be good. This was in 2004, they say no, it's not finished. It has to be a finished big project that you have to deliver together with the other. So it was the library in Alexandria, and then we got into the competition of the cultural co complex. And there was a lot of interview, because a lot of the American competitions, it's not a design competition. You don't do a, a design, you don't draw, you talk, and you talk about how, the, um, how you'll do the process and show what you have been doing before. And we never ever thought that a non-American firm could get any of the commissions on Ground Zero, but actually we won this project. So we started to work on that to see how that could be. Yeah, you maybe heard this before, past, present, and future. We said that the museum below grade with the wonderful park they were making is the past. It's the contemplative and emotional part of the project. And the new high rises are the future. They're very commercial, like in the US, and productive. And we said the culture is the informative, it's the present that always is changing. Uh, the first project we had was 30,000 square meters. Uh, the opera is 38,000, so it's a big commission. After one and a half year, we started an office in New York because it was a lot of traveling, and when we got over, they stopped the whole project. They said, no, it's too big, we don't want the users, we're changing the program, it was really nothing to do, and we were negotiating to try to find a solution how to keep on doing the project. So we said, actually, to get into the museum below grade, you need an entrance to go down. So we said, why if we do the entrance and then make an auditorium, and then it's the program, else is a small room up here for the families of the victims, and then it's actually the entry. When you go to an airport, you know, you go through security, here there are eight of those security lanes. So it's heavy, heavy security in this building. It's 4,200 square meters, so it's tiny. This is the museum below grade, here is our tiny little thing. These are the two pools uh, that are built extremely tough construction site because there are two subway lines, um, train station going through the site. So just to have a, a one column, it's almost impossible. And we were the last project on top. So this is the rendering. And uh, some of the facade elements called the tridents because the three parts on the top, they survived 9-11. They're kept almost like sculptures. So we asked if we can use one of them to actually point down to the museum below grade. So that was, and this is actually for the opening two years ago, 9-11. Uh, the most, 60% uh, of the park is open with the beautiful, uh, well-grown oak trees. If you had a chance to go there, it's absolutely worth a go. You need a time ticket, so you have to plan it a little bit. Uh, our project is still not open because there has been a long uh, run in the museum below grade. Hopefully, maybe sometime this year, we'll see. So when we moved over to New York and we didn't have anything to do, we thought that, okay, we have to try to get, get new jobs. Before we got the Ground Zero project, we had tried for 10 years 
to get a project in the US. And always in the end, when it was a culture building, nah, you're not famous enough. You know, you're not a star architect. We want that because it's always somebody has a lot of pay money that says that they want somebody else because we're not that known. But when we got there, we started, we had a, an opportunity to go to smaller places. So one of the commissions we got was actually Times Square reconstruction. They have been working for a very, very long time to say how they could do, redo something on Times Square. For New Yorkers themselves, they, uh, they are pretty negative about Times Square. They think it's way too touristic and they are, avoid to go there. Of course, if you go to the theater, you have to go there, but mostly it's tourists touristic people and not so many people living there. So they would like to change that. And for a long, they had a long discussion if it was possible to actually close down Broadway. And I also know that uh, Gale Architects been in there to test out, like they're done all around the world, to do this really important one-to-one -one test to close it down. I think that idea was already five or ten years old before he got in, but it's really uh, Gale Architects that did that. So we were also part of that discussion to do that. So when we did the commission, we had a lot, a lot, a lot of meetings, and we had a very big group to work on the project uh, to actually figure out how we could do it. Because um, all the commercial um, businesses that are there, specifically with all the signs, we couldn't do anything. So it's extremely horizontal project. And when everything is sort of overdone as it is, how can you make something extremely durable that has to take uh, so many people 24 seven? So we were looking into all the streets and what is really interesting with Broadway, which is the crossing street all the way through Manhattan, it crosses 7th Avenue and make, that is called the bow tie. You know, when you really dress up as a man, you have a bow tie. So this is, going to the theater with a bow tie. So this is the area that was supposed to be looked into. And they closed the street from 42nd to 47th Street in a two year period. In that testing period, they were testing a lot of things. One of it was, of course, to do a lot of site analysis. And this is the crash statistics to see how many was crashing car by car, car by bicycle, bicycle people to figure out how that was affected when they closed out Broadway. Because then the uh, road system had to change. So they figure out, yeah, it's so much better. Wow, one crash down here. Wow, this is much better. Pedestrian victim uh, in total in 2009, grand total. Yeah, so they figure out that Wise and Yoast was one of our partners that we're working. They did all these statistics. And then, of course, is the concentration of where people actually are hanging out. Mostly they are going close to the facades. Of course, I mean, when you had traffic, it's really uh, easy to say that that that's where you walk. But when, we, when it was changed and you had these paved areas that you actually could walk on, still people were walking close to the facade because it was not so easy to understand. So it took some time before they were customized to actually start walking where it used to be cars. But it also said that it was uh, the lighter uh, area in the green, seemed that they figured out pretty fast to start to, to do that. And then of course, there was all this different testing with a where are the most people? You can see here, mostly it's actually taxis, the yellow cabs that are driving on the street. And then we had to look at the section. How is actually we're going to bind these two, the bow tie together to make it feels like it's more or less one plaza. And then we had for the circulation to see where were people, where can we have the fast walking people and where could we have the more slowly walking people, the one that wanted to stay there for a while. Because mostly when you were walking in Times Square, you almost pushed from pedestrian around you, so you couldn't stop anywhere. We wanted to make new places that actually could walk slow, you maybe even could sit down. And then we started to look into, of course, you have the bow tie and you have the very clear direction in Manhattan. And then how to, because it's when you get from the subway station, it's really hard to orientate yourself. Could we use the pattern and the paving to actually or do some orientation to say north and south? Since you have the crossing over in Broadway, it can be really hard. So we worked with that. So we said that we had a scheme that's a gradient. 
so it's easier to orientate yourself. With, we actually put it some tiny things inside to try to do the orientation. So we were working, we had a long discussion about what kind of material. Um, and I think one of the uh, interesting points is coming from Europe and talking about uh, public plazas. We usually, a, a lot of times we use natural stone uh, and because it's so durable. And then the discussion with the Americans was, no, 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 it, that's, that's, so, that's not the, what we're doing. On all the public places, we use uh, concrete. Uh, but that's, it's not just because it's cheaper. No, because then it's like commercial and it's something paying for it if it's uh, natural stone. So that is like a way of thinking of public plaza that I think is very interesting coming from Europe that is of course the best should be the best for the people not for a private business which still is the case in the US so we had a big discussion about uh, what kind of material we could use but the pavers are precast pavers they're in two colors and they have this tiny pops or coins that actually try to catch us, the light from all the commercials. And of course, this floor needs to be evacuated in extremely short time. It, any event cannot last more than 20 minutes. It needs to have cabling that can take any sort of event with I don't know how many thousand people. So it has to be extremely flexible. Uh, the discussion about having any kind of furniture was from the beginning, they didn't want to have anything because it will then block the way and don't have the flexibility. But we really worked on that to see if there were possible to have any kind of big obelisks or secondary seating features. So in the end, we ended up with 10 different ones that had different ways you can sit on them. And we tested it out one-to-one, -one, and all of them has a lot of cabling, so you can plug in, and you can do a lot of other things than just for that. So the situation was that people were hanging on top of what they could, and they really needed to have a seating that you can walk on all, all over it, but actually you can sit in different kinds of way, uh, and they're not blocking the way. And for the testing, people start using them right away, which was really fun. This is still from the testing period. And this... Also for the renderings, it's, uh, we find it really hard. We have this discussion a lot of times to do a rendering when it's only streetscape. It's, it's, I find it really hard to make good renderings to convince a client to have good renderings when you're doing streetscape and urban plazas because they usually want to see something popping up but it's already there and it's very subtle what we're actually doing. Um, the construction side from 42nd to 44th Street uh, had to uh, be done extremely fast. So it started in late September last year and it had to finish December 15. And it was like, uh, I was there in late September so I, and then we were first time we were looking at how the papers were set and I said there's no way they're going to finish till before Christmas because it's so hard and you have so little space to actually do it. But they were working 24-7 to finish it up to get it ready for Christmas, to Super Bowl, and to Times Square New Year's evening. So the workers were doing an excellent job. You see the pavers, mostly the same size. We have these tiny pavers in between to adjust uh, the rendering. Uh, some of the big, all the, let's call it details, like where it's sloping down to the traffic, they're all in granite, and the big seating uh, elements are also granite, black granite and heavily working and then opening with the small pox, people walking all around. Durable for stone, easy to clean, and then after New Year's Eve, there was not only pox, there were all everything that was happening uh, 31st of December. So the two next phases will be uh, executed and finished to 2015. So this was the first fast part of the street and hopefully the extension from 47th Street all the way to Columbus Circle uh, as a pedestrian area will, will happen. And I think it's amazing that at last New York get this pedestrian area and hopefully that could be for inspiration for a lot of cities in the US. And again, is this a rendering or is it actually taken from the, the spot? Okay. 
A move over to another part of the world. When we did the LARB in Alexandria, we thought that maybe we'll get more commissions in uh, the Arabic world. It took a long time. It had to open and people start to travel to see the library before and then we were invited to competitions. And before 2008, before the big crash, there was tons of competitions. This was a competition in Saudi Arabia, in Dharam. Uh, the site is here, Bahrain, the Gulf. Um, and this is the site. It's like, okay, what would you do here? It's a big culture center with an extremely complex program. Uh, and we looked into the site, there is the fantastic, we thought the desert was beautiful, and there are actually even some trees, so there must be some groundwater. But of course, it's also a romantic way of thinking of the desert that we do. So our rendering for the project was this mirage, you know, and it's 70 degrees outdoor, you don't have any water left, and you think you're gonna die, and you're trying to, and then you see this fantastic over there, and it says, yes, I'm sure they will get some water. And of course, when you get closer, it, it's not there anymore. So when we did the, the project, we thought this will never, ever win. It's so far off, this project, but they actually chose us. The idea for the project with the, uh, with the program, all the program is said was really, they were equally important. One of the projects here, one of the programs is the first cinema ever, public cinema ever in Saudi Arabia. It's one of the few libraries in Saudi Arabia. So the program is very different from the, what they're used to. So here we said that all, all this different is seen as stone. And actually, the, you can find sort of these installations in the desert in, in uh, Saudi Arabia. And we said that the keystone, of course, is the most important to hold everything together, all we fall apart. It's also how you can look into the culture. And we did this again, past, present, and future. Maybe you heard this before now. We said that everything below grade is actually the past and the cultural history of Saudi Arabia. Where you enter, because most of the building has to be below grade, it's, uh, a lot of the program didn't need any daylight, so it could be without windows, and then it could be buried, which also helped us a lot to cool the building. And then the future going up could be really futuristic. This is a section of the building with the pebbles, that we call them. So the library and the Great Hall, the tower and the keystone. Um, we're 50-50 men and women in Snoheta. So we had a big discussion before we started with this competition and said, can we work in Saudi Arabia? Would it allow us to go get into the country? Can we be on a construction site? And then we figure out the program was so interesting that we actually could do, make a difference with the program and how to show with architecture that you actually can push the limits. And the client is Aramco. It's one of the world's biggest oil producing companies that are very international and they want to make a difference. So we have this Abayas, the Snoet Abayas. This is medium size Ostrich, she was the project team leader. Björg, interior architect. So we have three Abayas, small, medium, large, that you have to wear when you get into the country, not on the construction site. Uh, I just have to tell one stupid story, because once we were down there, we were, I think, f six female, <laughs> only female, that was presenting the project. One tall blonde, one red hair, one brown hair, small, one dark hair. And after two hours presentation and discussing, one of the Arabic men says, what is wrong with the Norwegian men? <laughs> uh, yeah, we had some problem with the facade. There were two things they said when we won the competition. You have to change two things. First thing is the facade. They didn't like our shiny metal cladding. So they say they had to come up with something different. And one of the big bosses, he personally wanted to be black polished granite. And that sounds like a graveyard. So we were like, there's no way it's gonna be like that. And that's nothing to do with the future. So we had to look into a new solution. We were testing a lot of materials. And then we're looking into, this is actually an oil producing company. They're piping up the oil of the, uh, in the country. Maybe we can use the pipes. So we were looking into our pebbles and starting to do a lot of testing. And we said that if we make the pipes, like you have yarn, you know, when you're knitting, you have a yarn, you do this to get your yarn to be um, organized. The same way we did with all of this. So actually the pipes, 
It's almost like a big uh, fingerprint. The pipes, when we have a window, they're 72 millimeters in diameter. When you squish them down, when you have a window behind, you, they are only 12 millimeters. Then you will have an opening of 60 millimeters. So you get filtered the light in. So we, we do a lot of one-to-one -one testing. And in the office, we have a very good workshop to test out the different kind of pipes we could use. And we actually, we managed to do that. The second point that didn't absolutely didn't like was the rendering that showed that the pebbles were just in the landscape. And we thought it was so beautiful with this pure uh, desert landscape. And then they said, you have to come up with something better. We hate the desert. I said, okay, we have to do that. We already had, there's an oil museum there today, which has a park. So we say we will extend the park. That was also part of our, our um, design. But the new should just be the desert. So this orange part, we had to come up with something new. And then we said, okay, we will make a new desert park landscape, which we call the monosurface, which should be monographic, not uh, like monoculture. And we start to look into all the geolo geological history, of course, the oil comes from the geology, and different kind of plants that is drought tolerant. So we looked into seriescaping. So it is a big difference from the lush garden to the monosurface that should be a dry garden and the entry. So we looked into the ripple of the sand dunes to find a pattern because we wanted to keep some of that. And we looked into the ways we could be led up to the center, look into how we could use the vegetation for wind barriers, theme gardens and geological gardens. We were asking so many times to get bot uh, botanic people into the project. How could we know plants in Saudi Arabia? So we, we had a hard time to search to find the right plant palette. Uh, we also used rammed earth from all the, that is stamped uh, sand that we actually can use from the site. Try to make that as the past part. We wanted to find a good palette and to have, make them have greenhouses on the site to actually uh, make their own plants. And then try to teach people to say, you don't need a green lawn, you can use your own plants and you don't need to water them. Of course, maybe they won't bloom more than every 10 years, but at least that's actually part of what belongs here and see the beauty of that. So it's a dry garden and a very different from what they're used to looking into a garden or a park. And the geology part of it, really uh, counting, getting all the geolo geological parts. And even they ask actually for a jogging path. I don't know how many are jogging in their abayas, but that would be fun to see when it's finished. And then the stamped earth to really use the sand from the site to make all the pathways. And then a discussion about the light, because of course they wanted their building to be green and purple and yellow and totally crazy during night time. And we said, no, you will not be able to do that. Everything that is part of the future should be sustainable and it has to be self-sufficient. And is there one place that you get enough sun that you can make solar panels work? It's actually in Saudi Arabia. And we said that you need to have all the light that should be very low. Oops, sorry. So uh, you can see the starry night. So we actually designed uh, new uh, light features, had solar panels on top, and then it just lit on the, on the floor. It is made together with Outsider, a uh, firm in uh, Copenhagen, that helps us to do that with solar panels. Really interesting. And then, of course, it's a construction site that takes a long time. We think now 2016, before it finished. This is rammed earth wall, part of the entry, and uh, now it's actually like this, one of the top leaders, Fouad, in the front of the building. This is actually where you enter below grade and it's starting to get there. It's amazing. It's 14, 14 story tall, the tower, so you will see it from long distance. And this is the image that we wanted to show to how actually these pebbles in the, in the desert and with the light waves that will lead you up in the desert landscape. Okay, I think I have two more projects. This is much more close by. This is in Lund in southern Sweden. You know, Skåne, Scandia was also part of Denmark for a long time. Um, Lund is an old city, it's a medieval city, and it has this big project uh, uh, that is going northeast, which is um, part of an ecological park or Max Lab 
with the Science City up here in 21. Uh, that is a synchrotron. You maybe heard of Saturn in uh, Switzerland. This is a smaller and a little bit different synchrotron. They already had three synchrotrons at the University of Lund and will make a new big one. This is a Google map of Lund and this is the site. It's really on the border and this is the new area that, that they want to explore a lot with a new part of the city. Um, uh, we were part of um, a competition uh, after four months, we didn't hear anything, and then they invited us for um, a workshop together with FUEAP, a Swedish architect firm. And the jury couldn't decide who's going to win, or it was they, they couldn't agree. And then they just decided to give the building to uh, FUEAP. And, uh, and then they said if we could do the landscape. And we were like, we can't just take one landscape from one concept to the other. And okay, then said, okay, what can you do? And we said, no, we can start carte blanche from scratch to do a new project. So we worked together with FOIA. In the meanwhile, something had happened. Just a little backtrack again. You see here this beautiful agricultural landscape, the patchwork. I mean, you never ever would build on such a site in Norway because we almost don't have any agriculture at all. So that's forbidden. But here they were supposed to do that. And, and they have figured out that it's really a flat area. This is a highway. When you drive on this highway, when you drive on a stone on this highway, it actually will be vibrations in the ground. When you have a synchrotron, that actually splitting light into electrons. And when the electrons jump over, you get synchrotron light. And that light is what the researcher use. It's a very good for cancer research. And they want to cover most on, most on Northern Europe to do research in this center. So it has to be totally stable. Totally, totally stable. So I, uh, I asked them, okay, maybe you have the wrong site. Maybe it shouldn't be on agricultural land. But the site was already there. So vibration are like waves in the ocean. So the flatter it is, the more of the vibrations go down into the earth. So the researchers said it was really critical. If it's, too, if it's not stable, the research can't be done. And then they said that the more uh, chaos you have in the surface, the less goes down in the ground, because the surface gets much bigger. So we said, this is a very interesting parameter we can work on. And of course, we were very strict about how you handle the water inside the site. You couldn't take any of the water, the surface water outside the site. We really had to work, of course, with um, uh, the mass balance. Cut and fill should be in zero. It, they had penalty for any trailer they would uh, have with dirt outside uh, the site. So we had to try to use all the masses that we had to dig to get to the, the building and reuse it. So that's how we then thought, with the vibration, to make a lot of chaos in the surface. So we said, this is the site, almost flat. It has to be done something. The linear accelerator is 420 meter and is below grade. All that cut, we need to fill somewhere else. OK, we have the ring, which is um, 600 meter in circumstance. So it's really big. 16,000 square meters inside here. Okay, we have to protect the circle. So we said the uh, tangents that go out from the building, where is actually where they take out the synchrotron light, we use that at one parameter. So we set the tangents at one parameter to make new surface. Then we have another set because it said the more chaos, the better. The other set was we made. Um, uh, um, a spiral, two sets of parameters. And then we did that in Grasshopper in Rhino to test it out. They said the vibration in the ground was 10 to 40 meter long wavelength. 10 to 40 meter waves. So we used the same. We said the closest is 10 meter wavelength, furthest out is 40 meter wavelength. To then get cut and fill all together, we figure out that if the uh, amplitude, the highest point from the top to the bottom of the wave was 4.5 meter, then we can reuse all, all of the soil. So we have this pattern on the surface. 
We started in January. In May, they had the Rhino model straight into the bulldozer. You can see here it says 195 meter fill to 49 meter fill, slope 0.6. I had to test the bulldozer. I was so happy when I was there. It was really hard to drive a bulldozer, as a matter of fact. But then they, when they did, took the cut, they took it straight to the end where it should be and shaped the new landscape. So most of the landscape was shaped. This is in September 2011. All of this cut was filled up with a new landscape in the new waves. And with snow on, really looks really nice in December. Keep on working with a big circle, starting building. And this is from August 2013. Uh, the rest, then they started to do most of the uh, rest of the landscape. They have a sedum roof on all the rooftops. What we also said that, of course, this is not a golf course. How can we use this as a park? Because they're not going to have a lot of maintenance. This is a contractor, a total contractor that has the maintenance for 25 years. So how to make that happen? We work together with the University in Alnarp, uh, SLU, Morten Hammer, very good professor. He had done some tests before. It's a meadowland very close to the area that has uh, been looking into all the plant material since 1866. It's a lot of red and yellow listed plants that are dying. Because of the monoculture in, the, in all the agricultural land, we're losing a lot of the plant selection. So we could take the cut from the meadowland close by, cut the hay, and took the hay on top of these. So we have three um, uh, um, summer and fall that they actually can grow because hay to grow hay take quite a meadowland take quite a long time because this will not open for before next year, 2015. Last year was uh, nice and dry, so we didn't get that much hay. This year, hope that it will be perfect, so we can get as much hay as possible. And we will use all the plant material that are natural in the area to put on top. We said it will take probably five years before it will grow properly, but we can still do cut the hay, because they say they have way too much hay, they can't really use it. They fill up about five centimeter on top, then it takes the moisture, it doesn't have a lot of other seeds that get in there, and you have an extremely nice um, uh, flora that it's much more, you could never do that in a seed selection. So here also, this is from January this year, which uh, you can easily see that uh, there are valleys, and also the researcher, they have done, also know they have written a scientific paper from the University of Lund. They have been testing and testing to see. They say that they are very sure that this will be more stable with the new uh, wavy landscape. Uh, if you're extremely, uh, if there are some extreme that actually when you just bump the right size stone and you're doing the research at the same time, maybe that once 20 year, you, they, they will not work. But most of the time, it will actually be much better for the research center. So we are taking the interior activity out in the landscape and made a new iconic landscape out of it. So that's from, uh, yeah, uh, a week ago. Okay, I think this is the last uh, project. Uh, mostly when we do architecture, landscape architecture and planning, we do it for people. This project is for the animals. It's for the wild reindeers. Uh, the wild reindeers actually live up on Dovre, close to Snøta. So we were asked when we were on, on our trip if we could make a site uh, study of the, a site to make a reindeer pavilion. The wild reindeers, yeah, and the strange thing about this area, for 80 years it's been a military area. It was given back, so now it's a part of a national park. So there's been a lot of activity. So these buildings, they used to be there, and there has been a lot of uh, action on all the roads. So it's been a very large revegetation uh, project for over 10 years to try to make the landscape be repaired. It's extremely fragile, the plants up, because it's on a high latitude. Uh, the wild reindeer, the story about that is, um, 
uh, very um, strange because from the last ice age, now we're talking 10,000 years ago, uh, the, the snow started to melt down in southern Europe and the wild reindeers lived there. And then, strangely enough, they followed the melting snow further and further up north till they still could get snow in the winter. Why bother? But that's how they like it. And they ended up on Dovre. So they have figured out it's actually the same from the cave paintings in Lascaux in southern France. There are wild reindeers. And they say it's the same, it's not the same animals, but it's the same family that still are now in Dovre. So this area, then the wild reindeer center, is a little bit away from where you actually can park. So this is to be in the mountain, a gentle slope, so everybody can walk it. You can have a stroller, you can be in a wheelchair to actually be in the mountain. And it's there to watch the reindeer. It's like a classroom inside the landscape. So as you see, it's not untouched nature. It's been a military area. And then the, we used then the old ways they were actually hunting wild reindeers. Now we're talking like 8,000 to um, 2,000 years ago. And then how that's how also we wanted to make the, the parking place. And the walk from the parking to the reindeer um, hütte up here to watch them. It's a uh, 1.5 kilometer and we had divided it up and you have the history from 8,000 uh, before Christ all the way till today and how the history of the landscape actually ha has evolved. And the concept is really easy because they wanted a place that they can view the reindeers. So you need a frame. So we were framing the landscape, framing Snohata, framing the landscape, you can look at it. And then we said that there is one room, so the interior and the exterior is the same. In a sort of a traditional way of using timber, this is a pine that is 20 by 20 centimeters. There's no glue, no nails, nothing. It's just tapped together. And it's, this is the outdoor, and this is the indoor that you can sit on. And you can see, and there is a small kitchenette, and there's, of course, a fireplace. So you, you can heat up. So you can sit indoors when it's really snowy, rainy. It's closed during winter time, but you can go, it's always open. And from the outside, the animals can watch the strange animals that are actually inside here, <laughs> like an aquarium. Uh, and it sits in the landscape that where it used to be the, um, uh, the military uh, buildings. And it just sits and reflects back the landscape. So it's a very easy frame that sat on top of the landscape. And a starry night, how you can be inside there. And of course, when we are celebrating up and we are on our hike, we always have and school when we're there, that's of course, I think this was like 62 snöhette inside the hütte. And that's actually my last picture. And what I want to say as my summing up is that I think, okay, we have been really, really lucky to work with a lot of big projects and cultural buildings. But I think the most important is not the day when it's open, it's really how it actually affects the society. And we really need to be aware of, as architects, landscape architects and planners, that we are taking care of and really thinking of the future. And I think the most important is that we actually can create some everyday magic, the places, the place making that we're doing, and hope that, that actually the work we're doing can push the world forward with architecture. Thank you for your attention. Tusind tak til Jenny. Øhm, vi har tid til et enkelt spørgsmål. Ja, det har vi egentlig ikke, men øh, det synes jeg øh, godt, vi kan tage. Øh, så jeg ved ikke, om der sidder nogen og øh, brænder efter at spørge om noget. Og så skal jeg lige sige, at herefter der holder øh, vi jo generalforsamling i Landskabsarkitektforeningen. Og den foregår i det, der hedder Lade Nord, som ligger derovre. Og der vil være kaffe og lidt at spise også, når vi kommer derover. Er der nogen, der har et spørgsmål? Vi 
vi er alle sammen fuldstændig overvældet. Det er imponerende, det er smukt, og det er også sådan lidt øh, misundelsesværdigt, det I laver. Øh, så tusind tak igen.